Today, we'll be speaking about heart, about social and emotional learning, about engagement and agency in our classrooms, about the role of leadership in our English classroom, and the elements of laughter as a trigger of motivation in our sessions. So let's get started with our introduction, okay? So we'll go through all these different concepts throughout the presentation. And for each one of them, I will be sharing at least one or two activities that you can use in your classrooms and that are ready to be first adapted and then adopted because Whenever we participate in the seminars, I always invite teachers to adapt activities first, because you know your students, you know how to personalize whatever ideas I share with you today, and you know how to make them shorter, how to make them longer in terms of time, how to adapt these activities for different age ranges, okay? Some activities that maybe I present today that are aimed at uh, very young learners might be very well adapted to adolescents, teenagers, or even adults. So the idea today is adapt and adopt, yes? So that you can leave this session with some fresh ideas and fresh activities to use with your students. We need to start with our first age here the age of heart. And because of that, I will be starting with social and emotional learning, the importance of emotions in our classrooms. And it sounds a little bit um, redundant, I would say, to say that emotions play a pivotal role in whatever we want to teach. We have learned this I would say the hard way probably during these pandemic times. I have been into social and emotional learning for many years, but during these very difficult times we are all going through, we have like a very explicit uh, result in terms of how emotions are extremely important in any learning process. Emotions are important if we want to talk about lifelong learning, you know, that we are constantly speaking about how to achieve learning that sticks with our students. And what we know through research is that there is no learning if there is no emotion, okay? So this image that I have chosen, it's because I would like to invite you to think about emotions as light torches. Emotions are information. Emotions happen naturally to us as humans. They are neither good nor bad. They are neither positive nor negative. They are inherent to our human nature. They happen to us. And there is nothing we can do to avoid them. On the contrary, emotions can propel or hinder the learning process. And because of that, we really need to make plays, yes, in our sessions to talk about emotions, to explore them, to help our kids cope with the very difficult emotions we are all going through and to learn that um, there is nothing wrong about feeling anxious, there is nothing wrong about feeling scared, there is nothing wrong about feeling worried, right? The question is, what do we do with these emotions, okay? Because of course, I am not saying that uh, we should accept any kind of behavior as a result of emotions, okay? So emotions are not behavior. Emotions are natural to us, they come and go, but of course we, can, as teachers of English, uh, share tools with our students so that they can regulate their emotions, so that they can connect to empathy, so that they can learn how to build better relationships with other people, okay? And we have some information from research about this idea that learning is 
facilitated or hindered by social and emotional experiences of both the learner and the teacher, okay? This piece of research I would like to share with you is by one of my favorite authors, Mary in Modino Young and Damasio. And one of the conclusions of their research by 2007 was that learning is facilitated or hindered by the social and emotional experiences of the learner and the teacher, which can help guide our attention during learning assist in information encoding and the retrieval of memory and effectively manage, regulate the social interactions and relationship that are all fundamental to the learning process, okay? We all know that we learn better when we feel better. We know that our students, if they are emotionally compromised, uh, it will be quite difficult, yes, for them to learn whatever we have to teach, yes? So this is one of the pieces of research that I wanted to share with you related to this aspect of emotions and the importance of emotions and social development in the classroom. I have a video to share with you that explains the connection of cognition and emotion. Remember that we used to think about cognition and emotion as two separate things. What we know from the research is that the best learning experiences we can offer to our students happen when cognition and emotion work together so that deep learning can be achieved, okay? So what we used to think as a dichotomy, emotions and brain, the brain and the heart. Remember that we used to speak about, okay, is my heart making a decision or is my mind making a decision? The best decision-making processes, the best critical thinking happens when both cognition and emotion work together. So a short video to explain the connection, these uh, dance between emotions and the brain, okay? Let's watch it together. When we hear the word emotion, most of us think of love, hate, happiness, or fear. Those strong feelings we experience throughout life. Our emotions are the driving force behind many of our behaviors, helpful and unhelpful. Just where do our emotions come from? Our brain is wired to look for threats or rewards. If one is detected, the feeling region of the brain alerts us through the release of chemical messages. Emotions are the effect of these chemical messages traveling from our brain through the body. When our brain detects a potential threat, our brain releases the stress hormones adrenaline and cortisol, which prepare us for a fight or flight response. When we detect or experience something rewarding, such as someone doing something nice for you, our brain releases dopamine, oxytocin, or serotonin. These are the chemicals that make us feel good and motivate us to continue on the task or behavior. In these instances, the feeling region of the brain kicks in before the thinking part. Sometimes the reactions of the feeling brain are so strong that it dominates our behaviors and we're unable to think rationally in the moment. Our emotions hijack our brain. While many of our emotional responses happen subconsciously, our thinking can influence our emotions and sometimes this can be unhelpful. Just thinking about something threatening can trigger an emotional response. This is where we can manage our emotions with conscious thinking. Our emotions play a powerful role in the way we experience the world. Understanding and regulating our emotions through our thoughts and behaviors can help us take greater control of our brain and achieve our goals. Excellent. And the good news is that we can help our students equip themselves with tools to regulate their emotions, to inhabit difficult emotions, to connect better with others, to build 
uh, empathic teams to build collaboration in the classroom. So the aspect of emotions is crucial to any learning process, as we said before. Throughout my presentation, I will be offering a couple of opportunities for you to reflect, my dear teachers. So I will be sharing right now some questions related to these aspects of emotions. And I will give you one minute to take down notes on possible answers to the questions I will pose for you. These questions will have no answer today, okay? They are just aimed at triggering reflection because I do believe in the power of inquiry, of deep inquiry, okay? So my first question today for you is, how do we deal with emotions and experiences such as fear, anxiety, trauma, worry, etc.? You know that we are speaking uh, at a worldwide level in terms of education of students and teachers that are absolutely traumatized. So this is my first question. My second question for you is, how do we create authentic brave spaces where our students can share different layers of emotions and experiences. How can we open up little spaces of reflection where emotions can flourish so that we can start managing them? This is the second question, all right? Um, so I will give you, and this is the third question, how do we care and execute strategies related to our own emotions as teachers, teacher well-being. So I will give you one minute, my dear teachers, right now, for you to take down notes on possible answers to these questions, okay? Again, they are not aimed at being answered now, but just triggering some reflection on your side. One minute for your notes and possible answers to these questions. Thank you. I see some comments in the chat. Thank you, Farhad, for sharing. I do agree with that idea. Body language. Exactly. Thank you, Luis. I love that. Thank you. Okay. So the aim of these questions is to trigger reflection again. Yes. And through reflection, we can start finding some possible answers. All right. Now I will share with you. One activity that I love, I love doing with my students. And this activity is called the Calm Preserver. You must have seen and you must have read about the importance of life preservers. Yes, you can see the image right now in my presentation. This is a life preserver. But today I want to introduce you to a new concept, and that is the calm preserver. So as much as we need a life preserver for our own safety, today I want to introduce the calm preserver. So this is going to be a tool that will help us connect with more calm, okay? So how does this activity work and I want you to do it with me. Are you ready to do it with me? Type a yes in the chat if you are ready to do this activity with me. We'll do it together so that then you know exactly how it works to adapt it and adopt it to your students. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so this is like this. I want you to draw. I want you to take a piece of paper. Uh, I will do it here just as an example. And I want you to draw a big circle. Yeah, a big circle in that paper in front of you where you are taking notes. 
This is going to be right now our imaginary calm preserve. Okay, so the activity works this way. First of all, you will have, let me just do it with you because I have my own calm preserve here, but I want to show you how it works. So you will have your big circle. So first of all, we will focus on the outskirts of the circle, okay? So right here in these spaces, I want you to reflect on things that stress you. Aspects of your life that make you feel under pressure, stressed, that kind of sets you away from this concept of feeling centered and calm. So basically what I am asking you is to write outside, outside the circle, stressors, stressors, triggers of stress in your life. So write three, only for this activity so that I am just exemplifying, okay? Only three stressors, three aspects, three things that make you feel again, anxiety, high levels of anxiety, uh, under pressure, you know, things that, again, are not contributing much to your well-being, okay? Ready? Could you identify three stressors in your life? Type a yes, if you could, and you have to write those things here outside the circle, outside my calm preserver. <laughs> of course, we can have thousands, right? <laughs> but we are only focusing on three at this moment as an example, okay? So now that you have identified your stressors, yeah, you have become aware of your triggers. When we talk about emotional regulation, the first, and I would say, most important step is to recognize which are our triggers, which are those things that act as stressors in our life. What are those things and people <laughs> that trigger these emotions that are uncomfortable with ourselves? So you have already covered number one, okay? So I will show you my con preserver. But before that, I will ask you to do something else. So you've got your circle, you've got your con preserver, and you have been working outside the circle, identifying different stressors. Now we will go inside, okay? So have a look at the picture. We'll go inside here. And here I want you for each of the stressors that you placed outside. These are my stressors. I want you to think of one strategy that can help you cope with each of those stressors, okay? Only one little thing. So I will give you an example. Here I've got, for example, one of my stressors is extreme workload. My strategy is deep breathing. Whenever I realize that I am kind of overexcited about something at work or that I feel a little bit under pressure, I remember my conscious breathing techniques, my deep breathing techniques, and that helps me. Whenever I feel, let me see if I can show you this one, homeschooling. I have two girls at home that are homeschooling right now. And that is a big stressor in my life. So what do I do? What is my strategy? Inside here, my calm preserver, this is me meditating, okay? Being my, doing my mindfulness activities. Whenever, for example, I feel here, that there are many, many demands in my life, I remind myself that I am enough. And I do some affirmations reminding myself of my own worth 
my own importance. Whenever I feel, for example, lack of focus, yes, I try to do some focusing activities on details. Whenever, for example, I feel stress, I have discovered during this last month or two, I would say that exercising helps me a lot. So exercising, deep breathing, paying attention to details, mindful work, and meditation are all inside my calm preserver because these are strategies that work for me. So as much as I can identify my stressors, I can also identify things that help me out, that help me regulate those emotions, that help me deal and cope better. So whenever I feel any of these things outside my calm preserver, I go back to it to rescue me. I go back to the activities inside my calm preserver just to rescue me. Okay, so this is my activity that I wanted to share with you, the calm preserver. Did you like it? You can take a picture, a photo, there you've got all the steps, or you can send me an email and I will be happy to share all the steps. I'm telling you that this calm preserver activity works miracles with students. Why? Because we are tackling the two most important aspects of emotional regulation. First, identifying what makes you feel like this. And second, identifying what helps you out. What are those strategies that really help you when you are being triggered by those stressors? Okay. And it's fantastic when they can create their own pieces of art. I did it with images, but you can use drawing. They can do collage. They can do whatever art piece you want to create with your calm preservers. So I challenge you to do this activity with your students and send me pictures of your students and their calm preservers. There is nothing, oh, how can I say this? There is nothing better we can offer our students than a toolkit to regulate their emotions, not only at this time, okay? Not only for COVID times, but for life. We are equipping them for life. Let me just move on because we have to go through hell today. I'm moving into the E, very big E of engagement. And now please allow me to quote our beloved Sir Ken Robinson, that used to say that the gardener does not make a garden or a flower or a plant grow. The job of a gardener is to create the optimal conditions for growth. And I like to think of us teachers as gardeners in our students' lives. It is not only our responsibility to teach them English. Of course, this is what we are um, masters at, right? This is our passion. We are teachers of English, so we do it through English. But we are educators. We are here to educate their minds, their hearts, and they are different languages, okay? <laughs> but I like to think of ourselves as these gardeners creating optimal conditions for our students to flourish. How can we do that? Through the concept of agency. So probably you have heard about um, our, le our learners becoming agents of change. For example, AG is the sense of accountability, of responsibility, of motivation to do things, to change things. So today I want to focus on learner agency. How do we empower our students to become the center of what they learn? And that's why my first element, the first element, and I would say one of the most important for agency in the classroom is centricity. We teachers used to be on the stage. We used to be queens and kings of our classrooms. I'm sorry, and I'm very happy at the same time to tell you, these times are over. 
our students should be at the center of everything we do. We need to help them move into the center of the stage where they appropriate of their own learning process. The second element I want to mention today is voice and choice. How much or to what extent do we help our students express their voices and make choices, even if they are limited choices, okay? So imagine we need to teach passive voice, yeah? A traditional thing. Uh, we cannot ask them probably, how would you like to learn passive voice? Because maybe the answers we might get could be, oh, I would like to learn about passive voice, sitting on the beach, having a drink. That is a we cannot do that. But we can ask them, how would you like me to teach you about this? Would you like to watch a video in advance so that then we just practice and we get into action together? Or would you like me to send you a very short WhatsApp message telling you the basics of passive voice? Or maybe you would like to do a collage about passive voice and then we practice some exercises. So this is a limited choice, but it's still a choice. Okay, so I really want to invite you to um, foster the sense of voice and choice in your classrooms, even if it is a limited choice, yeah? Whenever we are asked to choose something, we are being empowered. We feel empowered, we feel listened to. We feel that whatever we have to say is important for the teacher in this case. There is nothing more rewarding for any human being than the possibility of being heard and seen. So don't waste this opportunity in your classrooms. And then we've got personalization. And I've mentioned the importance of emotions for meaningful deep learning. And of course, the central role of motivation and autonomy. We have learned about this a lot through these last almost year and a half that, that we've been through the pandemics. Because in many cases, learning on our student side only happens when they are motivated and when they have a good sense of autonomy. But autonomy is a life skill that needs to be developed, right? So the more our students connect with their sense of accountability, the more autonomous learners they will become, they will be. But it's about becoming, it's about a process and helping them be more accountable for their own learning process, okay? And this is not uh, an easy step. This is not uh, a, a slight shift. This is a very deep shift of perspective because in many cases, our students are very comfortable sitting there waiting to listen to whatever we have to tell them and teach them. Agency is a different type of learning. Agency is about being the drivers of your own learning, okay? So this is what I wanted to share in terms of agency, which is at the core of engagement. That is our second part of our presentation today, okay? All right, so before we do that, I want to stop sharing so that I can see you a little bit before we move on. Can you turn on your cameras? <laughs> and show a hand, thumbs up if you're okay, if you're enjoying the idea so far. Oh, thank you so much. Now I can see you and I feel I am Thanks. not alone. <laughs> I am not all alone, right? You are all there. Thank you so much. It's also very important for us to see our students, the same as it is for me right now, to see some of you. So thank you so much. We are moving forward uh, because I have many, uh, many that's, that's more ideas. very well, but uh, the, video, my camera yeah. has been stopped by the host. Oh, okay. No, no worries. <laughs> so you Don't can't worry about that. But I, I, can, I, agree. I, can... I agree with you. I agree completely with this. Because as I, I've written before, I think that um, the students mustn't be afraid of uh, 
learning English. I, I tell them, don't be afraid of making mistakes because making oh, yes. mistakes Alleluia. is the best way of learning. <laughs> Absolutely. And making yeah. mistakes is at the core of what we call growth mindset. Yes? yes. And growth mindset is about understanding that there is no better opportunity for learning than mistakes. Yes. Okay. I, so I it is them. high time that we teachers move away from the, where is my red marker? I cannot find my red marker now. Okay, that we move away from the red markers, okay? Yes. I, Crossing I, out. May, may I tell you something? When I yeah. correct the, the exercises, I use a green uh, ballpoint pen for the good answers. And the bad uh -huh. answers with an X with, um, with a common pencil. Okay, excellent. Pencil. Yes. Pencil. <laughs> the, Excellent. Yeah. Because yes. you can erase pencil and yes. you can redo your work. Yes, but I never tell them this is the answer. Some, some students have told me, and mm -hmm. which is the answer? Yeah. You have to discover which is the right answer. Because if I tell Absolutely. you, uh, for instance, A, B, C, D, you you have chosen A and it's C, and I tell him, correct, it's C. It, it passes, there's no, nothing else. But if I tell him, go to the information, review your exercise, uh -huh. and then tell me if it is right. And I celebrate that. Yes, that's- I, I celebrate that. May, may, uh, <laughs> I'm not, I don't want to be a boring person, but when I was beginning to study English at the university, I was talking to my girlfriend and she told me when I was at the school, I wanted to learn French. And in the first class, I was really very motivated. And the teacher taught us 50, suppose 50 words or expressions in French. I studied all of them. And the next day she made a test, an oral test, yeah, three turns, yeah, three turns, seven, two, five, one, three. So, she, and she told me, I studied, I've studied a lot, but I was very nervous. And first round, bad. Second round, bad. Third round, nothing. So, and she told me, I didn't want to learn English any, uh, French anymore. And I told to myself, I'm never going to do something like that with my students. <laughs> Is the anti model. So you built your anti model, right? Yeah. Excellent. My girlfriend <laughs> taught me that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I love that. And I, I want to thank you. Thank you for sharing all these, these beautiful ideas. And also uh, John that was sharing also uh, some reflections on the, on the chat. Absolutely project-based learning would trigger all these aspects I'm mentioning. And he, and he was mentioning that it's not easy, right? But I have to say that it's definitely worthwhile, right? Okay, so let me move forward, my dear colleagues into uh, uh what do we have next let me see your reflection minute okay i have these two activities but i will move forward okay so i'd be happy to share these two activities by email right? these are two examples of activities that we can do in order to create higher levels of agency and engagement with our students these ones are aimed for uh, students that are in secondary school or maybe university or adult students, okay? So then you can send me an email and I will share these two activities. I want to do right now a little wrap-up revision of the first two points of my presentation today, okay? But we will do this little revision together with some movement and some music, okay? So this is how this works. I will share some ideas now in my slide. If you think that the answer is a yes, you will have to stretch out, yes? Stretch out your arms, move around a little bit, so on. If you think the answer is no, 
that is not correct what I'm sharing according to what I have said so far, you will have to do some finger snapping, but with crossed arms. So you will have to cross your fingers in one direction and then the other one, if you think the answer is no, okay? So let's do it together. What we are doing right now is a brain break for assessment. So you can do the same activity with your students at the end of your session to revise some concepts, okay? So let's get started. move into our first L of leadership. Yes, our students are leaders. We are leaders as teachers, okay? If we understand leadership as this agency to change things, as this ownership over learning, this ownership of ideas and knowledge and learning, okay? So leadership, I would like to share with you one of the examples of very young leadership that I've discovered during the last years. Probably you have seen her, maybe you've met Amanda Gorman. Amanda Gorman used to suffer from speech impediments when she was young, she's still has uh, this condition but she was part of um, the White House and the new president taking over. And I would like to share with you just a little bit of her very inspirational speech. Amanda Gorman is a poet, a very young poet with leading ideas about the world. So I want to give you the gift of listening to just one part of her speech. I will put it forward so that you can enjoy this last part of what she has to say. Only a minute and a half. Children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the West. We will rise from the wind swept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked south. We will rebuild reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid the new dawn blooms as we freeze. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. 
So this was the most important part of her speech. I invite you to use this with your students so that they can also feel inspired by her words and by her speech. She is an example of very young leadership. She is a very good example to share with your students about different ways of struggling and overcoming and coping and flourishing even through difficulties. So I really uh, wish you can investigate a little bit more Amanda, about Amanda. Uh, she's lovely. And if you follow her on Instagram and social media, she's got a powerful message to deliver. So leadership is about empowering our students so that they can create stronger, better stories, enriched stories for themselves, right? This is about uh, leadership in the room. Exactly. Thank you, Luis, for that. And this is my activity related to leadership. Leadership is about achieving goals. But first of all, we have to help our students create different goals. So this is an invitation. Your goals are an important part of who you are. Each of you will create a picture or a collage of the goal that you have for yourself. So this picture, this image, this painting, this drawing, this whatever you want to show, your student will show you, will represent that goal that they have for themselves. So you can choose a very big goal, like a life goal, or you can choose something small, all right? Maybe a very small objective that you want to achieve soon. The only rule for the activity is no words can be used at this moment, okay? So no words. It has to be through art, through music, through a video without sound, whatever they want to create, but no words needed at this time. Second step of the goal boards. Here you go. Write a summary plan on the board using the following one. First of all, you need to write your goal. Okay? Second part. If or when. If I do this or when I do this, then I will achieve this. Let's take one minute for you to write at this very moment your if then plan. Think about the goal for you, my dear teachers, a goal. Then move into the if or when part. If I do this, then, and then imagine the R way of exercises for conditionals that you might use at this point. <laughs> okay. So do it now. Write your goal. Write your if and your then for that goal and objective. This is a very visual way of helping our students connect to their goals, to their passions, to what they want to do different in this world to the contribution they want to make, or maybe to something that is a little bit challenging at this time. It doesn't have to be that big. It doesn't have to change the world. It only has to change their world with maybe a little challenge that they are facing. And this helps them, of course, use the language of conditionals for speculation. They can think about the future. They can, you can use a lot of vocabulary and grammar points here, but you would be helping your students to do and develop one of the most important skills in life is imagining yourself doing something and what would be the result of that. It's a change of perspective. It is expanding their own views and their own goals, all right? So this is my goal board activity for our L that is leadership, but we have another L before we finish and that L is laughter, the importance of having a good laugh with our students, with our students, never at 
at, at our students with our students because we saw that if you have a strong interest and self-perceived ability in math, it results in enhanced memory and more efficient engagements of the brain's problem-solving capacities, said Stanford professor and senior author Vinod Benham. So he was explaining the connection between a good, relaxed atmosphere, humor in the classroom, and academic results, okay? And of course, we know Dr. Klaschen, many, many years ago, through his theory um, of low anxiety learning environments. Yes, we know that anxiety prevents input and it kind of raises, you know, the affective filter. You have heard about the affective filters. Yes, the affective walls that our students create when they don't feel safe, as Luis was sharing uh, earlier today as well when we do not offer a safe environment for learning, for making mistakes, anxiety rises. And anxiety triggers the effective filter wall. So it blocks whatever we want to teach, okay? So how do we lower this filter? Through humor, through openness, through respect, through emotional regulation and inhabiting those emotions that are part of the learning process. Emotions such as frustration, such as anxiety, as we were saying, etc. So of course, as I was saying, Dr. Krashen said it many, many, many years ago. And we also know, but there is no research about this, that smiling makes us thinner. So <laughs> Why don't give it a try, right? <laughs> there is no research for this. I have no reference to quote here, <laughs> but I thought it, the image was funny in itself. So a little bit of humor to finish up our sessions. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a ham. Burger. No, let's no, no. Break let's it break down. it down. <laughs> I, uh, I, I would, 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 would like, 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 like to, 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 to Bye. 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 A. A. Hamburger. 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 <laughs> Hamburger. 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 Ham. Ham. Burr. Burr. Gur. Gur. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. It's not damburger. Hamburger. I'm not saying damburger. <laughs> I said, I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy the hamburger. Hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. Maybe we, we should don't stop. Quit. We don't quit. <laughs> we do not quit. Again, again. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a burger. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. Right. I would like to buy a okay. hamburger. Just a little I would laugh like to... before we finish our session, right? Because it always triggers all these chemicals in the brain. Remember the chemicals I shared with you in the video at the beginning? All these chemicals of the brain that promote deep learning, right? And before we finish, Remember, my dear teachers, that as Amanda Goldman shared with us in our video, there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. So as teachers, let's be that light in our students' life. So thank you so much. I guess this is the time for questions, for reflections. Uh, for reading you in the chat, for you to activate your microphones. Uh, right, Francisca, and share with us your thoughts, your reflections, how much you liked these activities, questions that yes. you might have. 
you can type them here or if you're watching us on Facebook, um, mm -hmm. we can, I'm also going to go to Facebook to see if anyone has um, any questions there. All right. Okay. And remember, um, I didn't have time to share two of the activities today um, for agency. So then you can send me an email and I can share those with you through email so that you can implement those as well. Okay. So let's see if there are some questions or any comments about this session. In the meantime, I would like to thank Cecil Chile once again for creating this space of growth and development for all of us teachers. It's always great to build community. I think it's one of the great challenges and one of the great learnings we've had out of COVID that uh, growing our sense of community as English language teachers is crucial at these times, right? So are there any questions? <laughs> We oh, thank you, Paola. Everybody's thanking you. Um, we have okay. John Saldiva saying, I needed the session to find enough motivation to go through the week. Thank you so much. Rita Pearson said that every kid deserves a champion. Let's be that champion. Let's be that light. Absolutely. Um, I love thinking. that TED Talk. I love Rita's TED Talk. I love it. It's a must. We don't have any questions on Facebook yet. Um, okay. But thanks a lot for this. <laughs> yeah, let's webinar. give them help. Um, so thank you them. everybody for uh, joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you left with some refreshed ideas and some food for thought. And I hope to see you soon sometime. And thank, thank you, Francisca, you. for moderating this session as well. No, thank you for, for being here. And uh, we're really thankful for everyone that came. Uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to, um, well, of course, thank you for taking your time for being here. Um, and I wanted to invite you to our next webinar next July 3rd at 5.30 p.m. Uh, I'm going to type the uh, registration link here, and the title is Podcasts as a Platform for Building Community and Facilitating Access to Knowledge. So we're going to continue with this uh, community building um, topic. One of the presenters, I saw him here in the guests, Daniel Guim and Jose Luis Poblete will be presenting. So you have the link to, if you want to register, you, you have it on the chat. It's July 23rd at 5.30 p.m. Chile time. And also we wanted to invite you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, um, our website, tsol.cl. And if you have any questions, if you want to contact us, I'm going to also type our email in the chat contact at tsol.cl. You can also find our this webinar and all our previous webinars on our YouTube channel. I'm also going to type the uh, website or our YouTube channel there. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Monica, for this wonderful opportunity to learn about these very important topics. And thank you, everyone, for coming and for taking time out of your um, schedules. I know teachers are very busy, so um, we really appreciate your taking the time. If you have any questions, now is the time to ask them because we're going to um, say goodbye if not. No? Well, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Great meeting you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.